Well, like yeah. we've had a bunch of musicians come down to like the Comedy Cellar in New York City. Like John Mayer was there a whole bunch a few years ago. Live from the Willie Nelson and Friends Museum Showcase in Nashville, Tennessee. It's Music is Funny. Musicians talking to comedians about music and comedy. With your hosts, Raylan Nelson and Jonathan Bright. So smoking, I'm so hot, I keep talking, I'm drunk, but I'm still drinking too. Welcome back to Music is Funny. I'm Raylan Nelson. And I'm Jonathan Bright from the Raylan Nelson Band, back with another ridiculous and unnecessary intro. Andy Fiore. Um, okay, so we start every podcast by asking, what's the first music you remember loving as a kid? Oh, very, very really first. Good. The very first, I think it was Michael Jackson. It was. <laughs> We've had that before. Yeah, it was. Uh, my parents are, my dad's a really old, was a really old guy. He passed away a few years ago at 96. Whoa. So he was 55 when he had me. Wow. So we, uh, he was a fertile was, guy too. Yeah, he was yeah. fertile. And, but he was a big music guy. He performed in barbershop quartets his whole life. And, oh, uh, wow. Which part? Yeah. He was a tenor, oh, uh, a, a baritone, I actually, I should say. And, um, so I was exposed to the old timey, like barbershop stuff. Yeah. But that wasn't what I loved. I didn't love, like, <laughs> hello, my baby, <laughs> that kind right. of stuff. <laughs> but I remember. This is how big Thriller was. I remember buying Thriller at Toys R Us. Like, that's how popular it was. Wow. It was. Everywhere. And I just rem I remember Beat It, like maybe being one of the earliest songs. I remember like performing it in uh, in my, my parents' record room because that's what we had. We had like a room where they kept all their records and their record player, you know, so that I think it was Thriller. Nice. So your parents must have been big music fans if they had a room devoted. They were. My dad was my dad was the music guy. My mom, not so much. My mom listens to and still does listen to AM radio. And that's all. AM oh. talk radio. <laughs> all right. Nice. Yeah. So was your dad obviously was into more than just barbershop quartet stuff. What kind of stuff was he listening to? Yeah, he was a music. He was a music lover. That's where I got it from, for sure. He, uh, you know, his passion, he sang in, but like I said, in barbershop quartets and almost exclusively with the same three guys for like almost 50 years, but he was also a part of the, of the, the Dapper Dans of Harmony in Northern New Jersey, where I grew up. And then later the big apple chorus in Manhattan in New York. Wow. Um, but he, uh, he loved a lot of classical and opera too. So I was exposed to all that stuff. Like we always had a piano in the house and he was always playing piano. So I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of music from really early on. Yeah. Do you have any brothers and sisters? I'm in the, yes, I have two sisters. I'm right in the middle. Okay. Well, what kind of music were they listening to? Well, so here's where my family gets weird. My <laughs> older sister is 15 years ahead of me. Uh, okay. In, so I was born in 79. Um, so she was already 15 years old. So she was a true product of the 80s, you know, all that great stuff. She was like in high school and college throughout the 80s so she was into all that stuff um my younger sister she was uh seven years younger than me so we're wow <laughs> how old were we're you? 21 years apart by age by the same um, father you're by the same father you're talking well this is where it gets kind of crazy <laughs> baby <laughs> my dad started having kids i was his first when he was 55 my older sister the half sister for my mom who is okay. 22 years younger than my dad so uh no she had my my sister young in like 64 she was like 20 okay. and then my dad came along like 10 years later so we're all screwed up over here age-wise so we all have super different roots and like super different eras and genres of what we listen to um but my sister, so that being said, my little sister was born in 86. So by the time she was like a teenager, the boy bands and the all that pop stuff and like the early, late 99s and 2000s. Yeah, that's that's my she jam. Insane. Yeah. Bad Street Boys, that was her jam. And oh, then she kind of took after me. She got into the Grateful Dead a lot, which was, you know, like Fish and Grateful Dead was like, then became like a high school thing for me before I started getting to like heavier stuff. And so... She's a big fish head to this day, my little sister. 
Nice. So having a musical dad, did you ever have any, did you ever sing? Did you ever, were you ever in any bands? Did you have yeah. any of that? <laughs> yeah. I, I got a guitar for my uh, seventh grade birthday. What is that? Like 13, I guess, years old. Yeah. And uh, it never went anything further than like garage bands. And, uh, you know, maybe some punk and hardcore stuff was the nice. extent of my capabilities on the guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, basic chords. So, um, no, the singing gene skipped a generation for me. My dad <laughs> always tried to get me to go and be a part of barbershop, but like, it just wasn't cool to me. And I was very insecure about my, my voice too. So. Yeah. I can understand barbershop being, not being that hip to a teenager. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's pretty badass though. When you think about it, when you watch guys do it, it's like, wow. It's, it's, you know, yeah. It's no, like, I respect it. It's like bluegrass when you're a kid. It just yeah. seemed like old people music. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I can get mesmerized into it now, though. It's really good. Cool. Maybe we should start a barbershop quartet. Let's right? do it. Yeah. Maybe Andy can join. We'll find a fourth. He sounds he seems like he loves it. <laughs> if you catch me like early in the morning when I wake up, I could be your bass. But oh. then after like oh. noon, my voice gets to normal. You know, you like JB, do you have that thing when you wake up, your voice, your, your bass is just like an octave lower? Of course. Yes. Just gravelly. Yeah. For sure. Because yeah. I don't get my voice right until a couple hours after yeah raylin yeah. sounds like yeah. she's this for the oak ridge boys with that bass when she wakes up if she's, yeah, on, exactly. if she's on her period her voice is very very low <laughs> <laughs> um, okay so have you ever written a song i i don't think i tried to i have tried to yeah um, i thought i i could uh i would sit down with like an acoustic guitar and i tried to be serious about it and uh it was just so awful <laughs> uh, i can't even like i oh my god i can't even believe i'm going to admit this do you guys know the the actress january jones from mad men yeah. yep i i tried to write a song because i hadn't heard about her until like i saw her in in like a magazine spread in like maxim or something in like 2000 and i thought it was a cool name i think i was going through a big dylan phase at this time so i wrote a song called whatever happened to january jones I thought it was one of those things where I was like, I got the title for the song. Now I just have to write the song and lyrics. And it never the went beyond this that. Yeah. That's the name of this yeah. podcast episode. Oh God. That's so never, embarrassing. Never recorded it or anything. I never recorded or anything. I said, I tried to write the chords to it on my acoustic. I, I just gave up. Cause I was like, what are you doing? This is so dumb. But I tried to write a comedy song. Early on, when I was like doing open mics, I thought that uh, I would just try everything. And I tried to write a comedy song one time. I can't even remember what it was about, but I quickly learned that that wasn't my style either. That was <laughs> yeah. the extent of my, my songwriting capabilities. We've also I learned, real easy. We've, <laughs> we've also learned that some comics aren't very fond of comedy musical acts at all anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, a genre not, I don't know. It's not for me. I will say as a songwriter, when you're first writing songs, it's, it seems easier to write a funny song because if they laugh, it's okay if the song sucks. Right. Because you know? I remember feeling like, I'll just try to make people laugh with my catchy melody song, you know, but then it just quickly gets kind of boring. You're like, this is... So what happens if they don't laugh? You just feel really stupid. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It feels like there's a handful of comics that once you get to a certain point in your career they feel like they can open it up and and start bringing their guitar and i don't know why that is i think you guys have probably had this conversation a million times about how many comics want to be musicians and vice versa yeah you know? yeah it's true yeah it's although true. carrot top had a different spin on it he's like every musician wants to be oh no every c comic wants to be a musician and every musician wants to be a musician <laughs> <laughs> that's the way he <laughs> Well, like we've had a bunch of musicians come down to like the Comedy Cellar in New York City. Like John Mayer was there a whole bunch a few years ago, and he would get up and try and do comedy. Um, he was probably the most notorious one. But, I yeah, heard he stories about that for a while. Was he yeah. good? He's I mean, okay at guitar. Relative, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Ti was doing it too, right? Is yeah. he still doing? Oh, it? Ti good. is terrible at comedy. Yeah. Really bad. But pe but he has so many fans. They'll come see him talk. Maybe once. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, at least one. You still, you only get so much leeway with that. I feel like in comedy, yeah, because especially if you're even a, even the big comedy stars, like even like Seinfeld will drop in the cellar every now and then, and people go, "Oh my God, it's Jerry Seinfeld," 
And if he is not making them laugh, you don't get that much leg room, you know? So, yeah, yeah. you really have to have it. For sure. And the young ones, I would imagine, we talk about, you know, the TikTok stars and the uh, YouTube stars that will get out and try and tour on that. And yeah, you get a crowd the first time, but probably nobody ever goes back the second time because like, well, I know they just stink. I know. Well, yeah. and I'll tell you, though, the one guy speaking of musical comedians who has really kind of sustained his career, Bo Burnham is one guy who's a really yeah. talented comedian yeah. musician, and he's been able to sustain that success. So I and there's, my hat there's some funny dudes that do it. Uh, Dean Del Rey. Well, he's just a, I'm talking about that actually do comedy and me like oh. Wheeler Walker Jr., that dude. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wheeler, yeah. And there was a uh, who was the guy before him? Uh, Rodney Carrington. Oh, yeah. He was big Rodney Carrington. Wow. So they, there's a few in there that could, but you know, few and far between. Let's yeah. not forget Dear Penis. Was that Rodney Carrington? <laughs> yeah, it's been yeah. a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so after, where after we? well, we were talking about music, but in, so when we've gone kind of through your musical thing. Uh, at what point did comedy jump into the picture? Were you, were you a fan as a youngster or is this something you came yeah. at? So got it. Yeah. Who, who was your first favorite comic? I don't know if I have a first favorite comic individually, but I was a big Saturday Night Live in Living Color fan yeah, and the Simpsons fan. So I loved sketch comedy from the jump and I loved the Simpsons. I was 80, I, you know, I was 10 years old when the Simpsons debuted. So that was like my ride or die. And then I started, you know, as, in Living Color just was such, it made such a huge splash with people of my, you know, age group. For and sure. it was like, it was the new hipper SNL, you know, it had hip hop and it, you know, it had black people, <laughs> like which <laughs> SNL didn't really have more than one. But I, I, and I still love the institution of SNL for sure. But then I started getting exposed to like all those like late eighties, early nineties there. It seems like there was a stand up show on at any hour of the day. There was like MTV half hour comedy hour and, you know, like uh, Caroline's comedy hour. Everybody had a comedy hour, you know? And so you'd start getting exposed to all these individual stand-up comedians. And I don't know if I can tell you one that I loved per se. I just knew that I loved that that kind of way that they made you think of something differently. And there was like a turn on a normal thought, you know, like I, a, a regular observation was all of a sudden there was this like crazy left turn. And that made me laugh. And I appreciated that more than any one comic. So I became a fan of like, I guess the art form more than comedians in, in, in when I was starting out. And where did you grow up? I don't think we talked. I grew about up in Morristown, New Jersey, which is like an hour outside of New York city. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, really close to the city. Yeah. Did you just go to New York? What like when you decided to do it, you were like, oh, I guess I'm yeah, going what, to New York or did you just start in Jersey? Or was there a so, moment so, that go that made you go, I'm going to try to do comedy. Yeah. It was, uh, I went to Villanova University in, um, right outside Philadelphia. And it was my senior year of college, uh, that my girlfriend who has an uncle named John Kensel, and he's still a Philadelphia comedian, very funny dude. One day, uh, she just goes, Hey, my uncle and his, some of his comedy friends are doing a show downtown. Do you want to go? And we went and we hung out with them afterwards. And I did that thing where I was like, I always wanted to try comedy. <laughs> and instead of shunning me, they were super cool and accepting. One of them was just like, we do an open mic at the Comedy Cabaret in Northeast Philly every Wednesday night. Come down whenever you want. And so I went like three times just to watch before I even had the balls to go on. And one time I came back and I just went, all right, I'm going to try and write jokes. Because there were only, you know, open mics are like two to three minute sets. So I just thought what I, I wrote, what I thought were jokes <laughs> and uh, I eventually went up and I did it and it, it went, you know, mildly. Okay. It went well enough for me to go back. And that was October of 2001. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. It was right after nine 11 when I, I guess I decided I was like the world, it's time for my humor to enter the world. <laughs> <laughs> People are ready for it now. Yeah. So I was a senior in college and, um, but yeah, then I graduated, I moved back to New Jersey. I was living with my parents and I was working in a deli and just kind of doing odd jobs after college. And, uh, I started doing 
what they call bringer shows in New York City. You know, you bring 10 people who are paying customers and you get 10 minutes. So, but that kind of got interrupted because I moved to New Orleans for like a kind of just a fifth fun year of not doing anything. I basically just drank and saw music down there. That's all you can do in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I like, I worked odd jobs. So that kind of gotten in the way of comedy. I didn't do any comedy in New Orleans while I was there, but I had a friend from high school who went to Tulane and he was just like, Hey man, I have a room in my house for a hundred bucks a month. Mind you, this is $2,003 we're talking. Right. But uh, yeah, I basically went lived down there for like nine months. And then I, I came back to New Jersey and I eventually got a job in New York and I moved in there and started doing stand up part time, you know? So that was kind of my trajectory of how I got into it. And then I moved into New York city in 2003 and I've been there ever since. So. I don't know how anybody can live in new Orleans. They drink like Germans. I've known people that were born there and they just raised on it and they can. JB has a great new Orleans <laughs> story. I'm not so actually. great. I broke my neck there. Uh, oh my god yeah i, was I know joking. i like how Raylan's like he's got a hilarious story yeah well dove he's in, fine you know dove so in the river, totally almost <laughs> dove in my river hammered and broke my neck but anyway that's new oh my gosh yeah, people i know from yeah, there he, he had to play shows with one of those big uh the halo well, well, no, brace i was out of right. that thing it was really just a stiff neck brace by that point i was out of the screws <laughs> I by that point oh i pictured it I no pictured it wasn't quite things. that bad but we did decorate the neck brace it wasn't like the headgear, you know. penises? Yes. <laughs> the, one of those neck braces people always wear to court to uh, emphasize a fake injury. <laughs> exactly. The exact you get one. more of a lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> yep, for sure. But it was so <laughs> long ago and that you could still. Were you smoking in the yeah, hospital? You could still smoke in hospital rooms. The guy next to me was smoking a Marlboro Red with my permission. Then he's like, can I have a cigarette? And she's like, if he doesn't mind, I don't. <laughs> so it was wild back then. That sounds like New Orleans, all right. Yeah. Tulane <laughs> Medical Center. But it was cool because I've, you know, I was, like those are my two big loves is like music and comedy. So it was, you know, I got a good education in both. I thought being in, New, you know, New Orleans and then New York. So, so you start. How does the writing process go? You got to get like up to ten minutes yeah. for the bringer show. Like you get, you do the two or three minutes. You know, at the open mic, you're like, this is pretty good. And then how long does it take? And what it, what's the next thing? Do you go? Oh, this is pretty good. I should just start writing more. So a lot of delusion early on. Yeah. JB. just <laughs> like, like music. Yeah. Well, so it's, yeah, it's a learning. It's just learning and doing by repetition until you get better. That's all it is. It's always bad early on, except for maybe like a handful of comics. I have an issue with anybody who's like, no, I was great right out of the gate. That's bullshit. You weren't. Yeah. Um, it takes a long time. It takes you finding comfort with yourself, finding comfort with the stage, you know, learning little things from just like not stepping over your laughs or stepping on jokes, but just to, you just write what you think is funny. And then just over the years, you learn how to write jokes and joke structure. Um, but yeah, like I said, doing those bringer shows, I felt terrible because, you know, you can only ask so many friends so often to come and watch you do the same jokes, but it was just mm -hmm. like, I don't know how to get more stage time. So it was a lot of running around to open mics and just really asking for favors. But yeah, it's just uh, the process of, of doing and then trying and then repeating that, you know? Um, and it's really a long con for comedy. There's no shortcuts. It's just, you have to do it, you know? And I think you learn early on that it's, it's, it's going to take a long time. You know, if you're, especially nowadays, there's so many resources and so many ways of, learning about comedy, I think any comic will tell you, it's probably going to be 10 years before you get pretty good. You yeah, know? That's the number of people quote on here a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when you're starting off, I, I, I don't, I shouldn't assume, but I assume it's kind of like musicians to where your joke, it takes a while to like, when I'm first starting to write songs, they sound like my favorite band at the time, or they sound Absolutely. like a song exactly. that I'm trying to, you know, my favorite stuff. And it takes a while to yeah. wade through that and be able to use your influences, but do it in your own way. Absolutely. I was Conan O'Brien for a little bit. Then I was Greg Giraldo and Dave Attell. You you become Greg, your influences. At least you for pick a some bit. good ones. You pick some good ones. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you do the same thing in comedy. And then uh, you know, it's somebody will either call you out on it or you just learn to be like, what am I doing? I can't that's I'm just being them, you know. But yeah, it's the same thing. It's hilarious. So when you start doing uh 
you start doing comedy in New York, it's probably a bit of a step up and you're kind of trying to break into that whole circle. Did you have any people, a lot of people have somebody like a class ahead of them or somebody that's got their door or foot in the door that sort of help you along. Did you have people like that to help get you started? Yeah, I did. I have uh, two guys who I still love and are friends with this day. It's uh, a guy named Andy Pitts and uh, another guy named Michael Somerville, who just had a baby, his first baby. So congratulations to Mike. Um, he, those guys. Uh, so there used to be a club. I'll tell you this story about the comedy connections. There's a club in Montclair, New Jersey. It's no longer there, um, but it was called Rascals. And I used to be a seater at there is like a part-time job on Saturdays. You know, I would just, people would get their tickets and I'd show them to their seats. And it was just a way for me to be around comedy and comedians and watch. So Andy Pitts was the feature comic for John Della Pina. I want to say he'll remember the headliner. I can't remember the headliner, but um, you know, Andy was middling, you know, where you do 25 minutes before the headliner. And uh, you're not the host. So it's like, a you know, host, then you have to step up to a feature comic and then you're the headliner. That's kind of the process. So he was featuring and the headliner was on and we were both standing in the back of the room. And this was like 2002. And I uh, I was just like, hey, man, that was really fun. I really enjoyed his set. I really had a uh, I really was laughing and I liked him a lot. And uh, I kind of did that young, naive thing where I was like, I, I want to move to New York and I want to try and do stand up in the city and he kind of gave me some tips he said if i whenever i was in the city you know hit him up and uh i did and then basically you know because of the time and me and everything that was going on in my life i i had a lot of gaps in between you know like doing stand up um you know, in this time, there wasn't the bar scene where there was like a bar show every night or like there was an open mic at a bar. Like there was just not as many opportunities that weren't bringer shows in New York at the time for young comics starting out. So there was a lot of gaps. And I'd say probably around 2008, um, I decided I really want to, you know, dive in head first to this. And so I found this little free magazine that was called L magazine. And it used to be like in a newsstands on the sidewalk. It would just be given out for free. And they had all these comedy show listings, these free independent comedy shows. You could find out who and where they were and when they were. So I found Andy Pitts's name in one of them in the East village where I was living at the time. And I wandered down to it just to kind of dip my no, my toes back into the scene again. And, uh, I was like, he'll probably won't remember me. And as soon as I walked in, he went, hey, Andy. And I went, oh, my God, Andy, how are you? <laughs> and he said, great, man. What's, what's been going on? How's comedy? I'd be like, it's been going really slow. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to, like, get up at all. And he then immediately took me to, like, five independent bar shows that week and was like, and introduced me to the people who was running th those shows. And they immediately booked me just based on his word alone. So I always owe him a debt of gratitude for that. So it was, it was guys like that who just for no reason other than being good people were just like, yeah, man, I'll, I'll show you the ropes. No problem. No sweat. And I'm still great buddies with him today. That was, you know, 15, 16 years ago. That's very cool. And I just thought about, so you talk about big gaps in between doing comedy. Like, as a musician, you can sit around and get better at your craft. You can write more songs, but you can practice, play. You can sing more and improve yourself. But, but maybe why it takes so long with comedy is, like, if you don't have an audience, you can write, but you can't. You can get better as a writer, but you can't get any better at delivering it at all right. unless you're doing it. Right. Yeah, that was uh, always a struggle. It's that one thing you really need as a comic is stage time. So, you know, it probably was a little bit of ignorance on my behalf to not just, like, find the open mics. Um, but I also kind of, in a weird way, thought I was better than open mics at that point because, you know, stage presence was never an issue for me. I'll, you know, happy to say that. Like, I, I never had stage fright or anything like that. I always wanted to be on stage. So I felt like as long as I could write some jokes, I would be okay. But yeah, like you said, you still don't know if they're any good. So you still have to do it. So yeah, it was tough uh, to the point where I probably... If I didn't go out that one night and see Andy there, I might not have ever done it again. Because right. if I didn't have those opportunities of getting on stage, like when it was, 
I, I probably just would have not put in the work and just, you know, just rather not have been bothered with it. Yeah. Yeah, because we talk about all the time how music or the arts in general, if you're trying to make a career out of, career out of it, it's basically statistically impossible. The careers we've chosen to to take <laughs> off on us. So if you're not, if you if you're not ready for the long haul, you learn very quickly. A lot you of know, those. Once you yeah. before age thirty, you figured it out. Like I'm either doing this or I'm not going to do this. This is ridiculous. Exactly. And yeah. I can't blame anybody for either decision. Actually, right. I wonder what right. I'll think when I'm thirty. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting time. Yeah, yes, we'll see if it continues on or not. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> so working out of New York, I know, I mean, there's a couple of different ways. I think back, you could have done it back then. You can pretty much start building your career just in New York. Did you get out and hit the road at all? From at, Or at what point did you decide, I'm going to get out away from New York and try and go out in front of people that aren't New Yorkers? Yeah, not for a few years after really doing exclusively New York. I did as many shows as I could in the city. And uh, this is also, I'm a very insecure person too. And I hate asking people for favors. Yeah. So not a great quality to have in show business, but (laughs) um, it took me a few, it took probably, and it was, it worked out because by the time I I finally got on the road and, and actually asked comedians, Hey, can I open for you? Can I host for you? Um, I was probably good enough to, you know, work on the road. Um, so um, yeah, a guy named Mike Gaffney would uh, would bring me out, let me host for him, um, and, and these were like local New York, New Jersey shows. And uh, yeah, it's a weird process. You just start hosting on the road, and then I've worked with a lot of the same promoters over those years. And so by working with the same people, they see you progressing and getting better. So mm-hmm. eventually, you know, you get enough material to be like. Hey, do you think next time I work uh, a show, you have anything maybe I could feature one time, you know? So then you're, take, you're taking that next step to doing like 20 to 25 minutes. So then you're growing and you're cons- and you're writing more. And then after years of that, you just start to kind of collect all your material together and go, hey, maybe I have enough for a headlining set. And so you ask those favors again, local people like New Jersey, where I knew I could maybe have a little bit of a draw from friends and family. Um, and just a promoter who has seen me for a long time. And you go, hey, man, I, I'm trying to start to headline. Do you think if you ever have anything for me, I would love to do it. So that was kind of the way I did it. I really uh, put it together over a long period of, amount of uh, a long period of time where eventually through your presence and just being around, you get yeah. those opportunities, you know? Yeah. And being cool to, yeah, to the promoters. Good, good Absolutely, person. too. Because yeah, we've that's talked about I've... that being independent. Uh, we make it a point to, you know, we're, we're nice people anyway. But when you're dealing with the clubs or dealing with the staff or dealing with the promoters, you make it easy on them. And then if you go Absolutely. and perform well, they remember you and they're like, any hole that opens up. And they want they want you to, they want to help you get bigger and bigger and bigger. And Absolutely. it's valuable not to be an asshole. Absolutely. I can't stress that enough. If any young comics, just be nice, be a nice person to work hard, show up on time. Don't make their lives harder in any way. Don't be a diva. Don't, you know, don't ask for demands, especially if you're not the headliner. Like they don't really give a shit about anybody. It's like if you're in the green room and you're like, oh, sorry, can I want, you know, doing this and that, like they don't really care about you because you're not the headliner. Yeah. So yeah, just be a good person. And I've always prided myself on that just being friendly and nice and like uh you know if you can do something for the staff too as a headliner they will remember that more than anything if you bring them donuts or something or candy david tell brings candy every single show he does everywhere and people you know remember that and (laughs) that's a nice move yeah exactly it's a great move it's it's, you know it's like little random acts of kindness go a long way especially to i'm sure i'm Comedy club cra- uh, uh, staffs and I'm sure music venue staffs are are the same type of people, you know, that <laughs> all they want is just a little respect from the artists and even goes a long way is just to be like, hey, man, how you doing today? I always like ask I because I feel like those are my people. You know, I'm here to make the audience laugh, but I love talking to the staff. I just like, how's your night going, man? Is it going all right? You know, you busy. What's up? How's the you know, if I get to, I've been to clubs now that I've worked for a couple of years in a row and you see the same, the same staff year after year. 
So you get to know them and they become, some of them become friends. They're like, how's, how's your mom doing? How's, you know, like that stuff goes a long way. Yep. We have the same experiences with that. We're going to yeah. do candy too. We're going to leave candy the same, but we're going to do the king size candy. We're gonna oh, do now you're yeah. going to. Yeah, you're we're gonna need a bigger. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger guarantee. If <laughs> yeah, that's crazy with that. They will really remember us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've done radio too, right? Yeah, I've kind of had a weird, wacky career as uh, a comic that kind of led me to radio. So I went, you know, I went to Villanova, majored in communications because I didn't know what I wanted to do, but uh, I knew I loved media and film and and radio, and I did love all that stuff. So I wanted to just, I don't know, have a major where if potentially that stuff came up, I could use my college degree. So I was bartending uh, during the day in Times Square in like 2010. Uh, and it was at Rosie O'Grady's. I had a great shift. I was working Mondays through Fridays, 10 to 6 p.m. So 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. I had the day shift so I could go do stand-up spots at night. And then I had Saturdays and Sundays off so I could like hit the road or just do as many shows as possible I wanted. So it was good. I was making like decent money because of my location of the bar. It was off Times Square. I had a good lunch crowd. I had some regulars. So I was supporting myself kind of just bartending and doing comedy. So it was going OK, you know, and then the bar got bought and sold to, uh, you know, corporates now at TJI Fridays in Times Square. <laughs> and uh that kind of pushed me into the reality of, well, now I have no income, really. I wasn't making that much money in stand-up to afford my apartment in New York City, so I needed to do something. So I decided to kind of go back to school and get, like, an advanced degree in radio. Um, and then I kind of, at, like, 33 years old, got an internship at Sirius XM in the comedy department. And uh, I did that for two semesters and then they hired me as a part-time board operator. So I, you know, I sat in front of the soundboard. I engineered any show that needed a guest, you know, or had like somebody call out sick, somebody needed a fill in. I did that, which, you know, it's a great way to learn. I could just get thrown into the deep end of, of, you know, board opping every single show on Sirius XM. And then after about a year and a half of doing that, a uh, full-time position uh, for a producer opened up in the comedy department. And I had always been in constant touch with those guys from working with them as an intern. And they offered me that job and that was 2012. So uh, yeah, that was 10 years ago. So, and then I just, now I'm a program director and a senior producer for a bunch of, you know, I produce uh, Larry, the cable guy show, which we had Ray Lynn on. And yeah. um, I get to host my own show once a week. And, you know, my albums play on there. So that was like a real kind of blessing in disguise when that bar closed. What's your I, show called? Your my show's The Raw Report. It's on Thursdays at 4 okay. p.m. East on Raw Dog 99. And, uh, yeah, I love it. I love radio. And I think that's also something that comes from, like, my old parents. Like, I, I grew up in the car listening to talk radio. And then, yeah. my dad, you know, so I always – I loved that medium, you know. Are they into podcasts now, which is – Basically, my, no, know. my mom has no idea. My mom's never heard anything I've ever been on. <laughs> she's come to see me do stand up before, but if you ask, she doesn't, she doesn't have a smartphone. She still has a clamshell. Good know, from her. Nine text messenger. Like she couldn't tell you what a podcast was if you paid her. <laughs> that must have been kind of a dream gig or a dream offer when you think about you doing comedy, you being into radio, knowing how to work the board, and then, hey, you want to just run this whole deal you know it had to be yeah. wild to uh, like holy shit this is amazing it, it yeah i i'm lucky i'm very blessed and lucky it, it's a, been a good combination because of not only learning how to do all that stuff and and having that safety net of a full-time job with health benefits and all that stuff which a lot of comics don't get but they're super cool to me about you know doing stand-up and being able to go on the road and if i need to take time off i just take the time off and uh, not only that, it's the opportunities I've had through there, just meeting comedians who come through and like, I, I'm, you know, meeting guys like you, like Ray Lynn on our show. And just, it just opens you up to the, like this world you just might not have ever been a part of before. So, you know, Tom Papa is a guy a comedian. I love. Yeah. He's yeah, great. We, met, we just met one day. I had to, I worked, I started working on his show. Um, and then I, I took over producing it, but then, 
one day he was just like, do you want to open up for me on the road? I have a bunch of gigs on the East Coast that I, I just could use. I saw, you know, you're great. I would love to use you. And so, like, we've been working together for years now. So, Yay. Yeah. Here's some bread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I've not gotten any bread from Tom Poppy yet. How dare him? We had Damn a- outrage. He's got to be as nice as he seems. We've had he him on. We talked to him once. It's like, this has got to be one of the nicest guys in the world. He really is one of the nicest guys in the world, one of the most generous guys in the world. And, like, anytime I'm always, you know, like, promoting my album and promoting my special that's coming out in October, he's like, come on our show. Let me – whatever I can do to push it. So he is a really sweet guy, really nice guy, and has one of those, like, amazingly underrated comedy careers – for sure that you don't really think of like he's written books he's been in movies he's has netflix specials and he's VR. just a killer yeah you know yeah. he's so sweet and, and nice. it trips yeah, me yeah, out that he and uh, geraldo were running buddies back in the day that okay. trips me yeah. out yeah did their first i, know, I love that too because geraldo was my guy and i love he was like geraldo's the first guy he ever met in comedy you yeah, know, apparently, so I, I apparently in the car and I'm like, tell me this Greg right? story again. Dad. Yeah, apparently they just <laughs> yeah. met at the first open mic they both did together. Yeah. And apparently yeah. Greg was just about to faint from nerves and Tom's like, Come on, guy, we got this. <laughs> just stories yeah, of them yeah. driving around motorcycles in New York, you know, going to comedy. Totally. And I'm, I know. Geraldo's my guy too, man. That whole uh tough crowd era of comedy was same on I forgot to mention tough crowd, but that was a huge one for me too. Opie and Anthony, I, I I listened to and I got exposed to all those Opie and Anthony guys: Bobby Kelly, Keith Rich, uh, Robinson, uh, Norton, obviously, but Greg Giraldo and Patrice. Uh, Patrice, yeah, Patrice is my guy, and so I, I loved just you know when I finally got into the comedy cellar to be able to be around a bunch of those guys and meet all those guys, and uh, yeah, really cool. I always felt like an idiot because I was, I mean, I knew I was aware of all those comedians. I, Opie and Anthony, I, I was a late comer to because I just heard the name of the show and I thought it was like Bob and Tom or whatever, like some regional I typical, you know, be DJs. And then <laughs> and I finally heard it. I was like, oh my God. I know. I know. I still go down rabbit holes of, on YouTube of old Opie and Anthony. So do I. And just I do the same up. thing when I'm driving to gigs. It's just such a good time killer. For sure. So what I, I got to ask, I know what a producer does in a studio in music. Like when you're producing a radio show, like what is, I'm, I know you're responsible for it, but do, do you oversee, you know, the cameras, the board? What do we actually do as a producer? Yeah, the board's the main thing. We uh, Cameras are a pretty new thing for us in radio, but, you know, the popularity of podcasts and then apparently people love to watch us talk and be on podcast. Like watching. people yeah. love to watch podcasts. I love so it. we've been starting to put the cameras in there. Um, yeah, you're kind of just the 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 Wizard of Oz of all. You're the man behind the curtain of all things. You know, booking guests um, in studio live. You're uh, you know doing anything from screening calls to. But yeah, like my main job is if it's a live show, I'm running that board and making sure we're on the air, and you know, uh, making sure everybody sounds nice. But then it can go one step further if it's like, you know, a, a show with a lot of drops, like it kind of like sound effects or anything like that. You're, you're kind of, that's a fun thing to do too. If you're in a show like that, I've been on shows like that before where it's like, you're almost then being a part of the comedy because you're adding those drops to right. the comedians you know, uh, uh, banter, if you will. So that's a lot of fun, but, um, yeah, you're basically, um, you're running everything from start to finish. So live in the moment, you could be doing anything from uh, making sure everybody's levels are correct, to just making sure that you're on the air. But then after the show, you're editing, you're, you're loading the show for replays. You're doing everything. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot, but um, it's really, I love it. I really do. Have you ever lost any of the recordings? Cause. We- oh, so many times. Good. <laughs> So many times I've just forgotten to hit record. You know? Same, same here. Right, you just give two big thumbs up. You're like, we're good to go, gang. And they're often running. It's the best show you've ever done. And then you go, I didn't record this at all. Sorry. <laughs> uh... Now, since you have some of that technical expertise, did you ever, any of, com- <laughs> any of your comedian friends come up to you and go, hey, man, I'm going to start a podcast. Can you hook me up? Can you tell me what to do? How do I do this? Yes. That's unfortunately a thing I deal with a lot where you know, <laughs> I, have, I have friends going, hey, man, can I can I be on Sirius XM? I go, well, it's first of all, not up to me. Uh, it's a little harder than that. Um, you know, write me and I give, tell me the idea and uh, then maybe we can pitch it. And they go, 
all right, I'll think of an idea. <laughs> oh, so you just came to me wanting to be on Sirius XM. Yeah. But just, I had other people that was actually going to be my it. next question to you is how do <laughs> no, we really, no. <laughs> just think you're of welcome me. anytime. You guys are welcome anytime. But it is funny. I've even had friends just be like, hey, man, can I get a job there? It's just like, I don't know. This took me 10 years. To get here. Sure. Yeah. Maybe you can. I can't. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, comedians were so dumb and honest sometimes and blunt. It's just like some of us are just, egg, you know, my God. Well, I could also see as a comedian having the gift of gab going, well, how hard can it be? Just turn the mic on. Let me talk for an hour. And I know that it's, it's, you start like, uh, and you look down, you feel like you've been talking for 15 minutes. It's been three, you know, it's just been 30 seconds. Yeah. And I always feel like I'm rambling anyway. So I don't know. That's good yeah. for radio and podcasting, though. Rambling, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah. Hey, well, tell me the name of your special and tell us about it. What so my special is called Check Right. It comes out October 6th. It's uh, Thursday, October 6th, which is kind of special to me. Um, we talked a lot about my dad. That would have been my dad's October 6th would have been his 99th birthday. Uh, um, so I thought that was a cool release date. And uh, Check Right is a actual a bit I have about him. Um it's a thing he used to say when he was driving us uh, as kids and adults. My dad drove right up until the very end. Um, mm -hmm. And he was like a super physically fit guy, really um, aged well into his mid 90s. He was still driving. Um, so like he was a World War II veteran. He was an Olympian at one point, uh, had kids obviously late and, you know, never missed a, a practice or, a, you know, a opportunity to go throw the ball around with me or anything. Drove me to like ice hockey practices at five in the morning was really like an all star, amazing dude. So uh, it's dedicated to him. It's released on his 99th birthday. And my dad, when he was driving and you were sitting in the front seat, when you were sitting shotgun, JB, um, if you were uh, in that passenger seat and you'd come up to a stop sign, he'd look left, he'd go check right. And he'd just <laughs> bark at you to check. So then you just had to judge traffic for him i don't know why he never looked but i swear <laughs> to god this is true i'm not making this up he would go check right and you would have to be very accurate because he was very truck he went on your say so no matter what i was so, about to, i was about to ask if anybody ever fucked up on that check right yeah i fucked up a couple of times i just <laughs> one time said like no kind of under my breath and he is he was all he didn't hear great so he heard go and we just <laughs> off in the traffic we went <laughs> and luckily, like, you know, we cut somebody off and we didn't get in an accident or anything, but horns are blaring and you know, my dad didn't hear the horns or anything. But yeah, you learned not to mix up, you know, confuse two words that sound similar. You got to get like an all clear or like, uh, you know, something really uh, clear to him that it's OK to drive into traffic. I don't know why he never looked. It was just such a bizarre. But he, he had all those when little he was driving alone. I don't know what he, I guess he just, you know, rolled the dice or uh, craned his neck. <laughs> just let go, let, let go and let go. Made it to 99. Yeah. Let go and let go. <laughs> so, yeah, no, he, yeah, he passed away a couple years ago, right? Like, luckily, like right before COVID hit, like right before it got bad, because he didn't, it started to happen. He died in June of 2020. And, you know, March hit and uh, he was kind of going a little downhill. So he wasn't really leaving the house anyway, but he, <laughs> he wanted to go get a haircut. My mom's like, you can't, you can't go get a haircut. And he was like, why not? And he's like, <laughs> my mom was like, it'll, it could kill you. And he was like, that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> he didn't <laughs> understand COVID. He was right. like, I've been getting haircuts for 95 years. It's not going to kill me now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he had all these like little mannerisms and these just quirks. And he was just a weird, like a weird, lovable guy. So, you know, the whole thing is not a bad. There's like 10 minutes about my dad in there, but yeah. you know, it's dedicated to him at the end. So yeah, it's on my YouTube special, youtube.com slash Andrew Fiore. And you can find it there and also be an audio album. So you can hear it stream wherever, but uh, yeah, I'm really proud of it. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm proud of it. And also you guys probably know from just, you know, record, like, uh, are you guys like comedians? Just, you can't listen to yourself after. I can't, we edit the whole thing. I've heard it so many times. I can't fucking hear it anymore. JP's good at listening to us after. I don't like to listen well, to myself after. I get to, I so get to the point, though, because I do the engineering and mixing and all that stuff. Yeah. So she comes in and sings, and then I'm the one, much like yourself, when you're editing, hearing 
not even the whole song over and over again, but maybe eight bars of over and over again while <laughs> right, you're right. trying to get something right. And so by the time it's done, and by the time the video is done, we're done editing that. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't need to hear this song for a while. Yeah, it's yeah. not because I hate it or it sounds terrible. It's but just like fuck. I've heard it so many times. Even performances, you're you're better at watching. Uh, you know, like I don't want to see us do it. I don't. Oh wanna, yeah. yeah, I'm not good at that. No. See, I, there's a difference there is because I think as comedians we're constantly trying to tweak and find the best word or a different word that's maybe or a funnier word. So it's a really important lesson to to go back and listen to your sets over and over yeah, again. Yeah, I get that. And yeah, then Steven. try it again because inevitably I'll say something a little differently or the cadence will be a little different and it'll be funnier and it'll be better. But it's so hard. It's so goddamn hard. Yeah, but I what really if you listen to it? What if you think it's really good because you felt like it was good and then you go and listen to it and then you just want to kill yourself? Because yeah, that's you every hear. time, Raylan. That's all the time. <laughs> I edited this thing with my 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 best friend from from literally kindergarten is a professional video editor, and so he edited for me. You know, I just sat there in the room with him the whole time, and I just went ah. ah, ah. It's just like I can't wait for this to be over. So it's like, and there's you guys know there's so many little things. It's like pick approve this picture for the cover, and you're like, I hate looking at myself. I don't know. It's fine. Yeah, you know. Other than so, I, I guess the difference between comedy and music is, if you're watching yourself, it doesn't really matter how it's captured comedy wise because you're gonna you're just hearing the words. But if you're watching a band, somebody could be standing just in the wrong spot recording you playing and it's not picking up anything but maybe the drums and bass right. or something like JD. that and right like, god we sound like shit and like no you're just not standing where you're supposed to be and it's not a tiny thing thanks jb well you know but you can just do yourself. and we're running you know, late on time but before we get out of here you, you did some work with larry the cable guy and foxworthy right yeah well i produce uh i run the larry the cable the jeff and larry's comedy roundup channel uh sirius xm 97 is that um, how you met those guys that's how I met him. Yeah. I got thrown into the mix there. That was kind of like a young, when I was a young producer a couple years ago, um, they needed a uh, board op for the uh, weekly roundup show that Raylan was on recently. And so just over time, I now, I like I'm the executive producer with Moral, uh, another one of my, my coworkers who I would be nowhere without. Um, so, but it, it, he's one of those guys who is super, you know, like Cable Guy and Foxworthy were not my cup of tea comedy wise when I like, you know, JB, we have this, you know, kind of, I think, same sentiments towards comedians. Um, But God damn, they're both so funny and both they really professionals. Are. They show up every time ready to like do the work. And it's just it, like that also opens up your eyes too. It's like, oh yeah, man, we all are, we came through the same struggle. Everybody started out the same way and they have been nothing but great to me. They're super easy to work with. And uh, yeah, we've been doing like every year before COVID happened, we would do a live show of the weekly roundup in Larry's home club in Nebraska, the funny bone, which was great because then they had me back to, you know, like headline after that. So it's just like, Little things like that, that, yeah, I never knew them before working for Sirius XM, but I love them to death now. I, I consider them family. Absolutely. I always thought they were hilarious. And my tastes do run towards the darker comics. But yeah. when I heard Foxworthy's, whatever his first big record was, just him, I was laughing. I was like, this guy is, he can write some jokes and he's funny. <laughs> Absolutely. And they're yeah, the guy mean, too, both of them. They made me laugh. For sure. You know, it's like, you know, like I said, it's just, uh, you know, I'm I'm not filthy, but I'm also not clean. Right. And, you know, those guys are, are for the most part. And uh, like I said, a different kind of mentality comedy wise. But I love them. They're so great. And I, they're so great together. They're really, really funny guys. Like they made it. They're successful for a reason. You know, like you for can't, sure. you can't fake it for so long, you know, right? like eventually you'll 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 get found out. And they're the real deal, you know. Do you think there's more board op jobs now than there used to be just with podcasting or everything? Or maybe that maybe it's the same, but there's a transition from radio to podcasting because there's less radio jobs, but it seems like there's a billion podcasts and, you know. Yeah. I wonder if there's there's more producer jobs out there. I think there are um, just by nature of them being so many podcasts, whether it just be like talk or comedy or anything. Mm -hmm. um, I do think 
one of the really cool things about this time we're living in is that it's such a do it yourself era Yeah. Yes. where, you know, if I needed to do my own podcast, I could edit it. I could put it on, you know, I could board up it. I could do it all myself. And I think so many comedians um, are doing that these days. So I do think just by the numbers of how many podcasts are, there are more of those jobs available because us also face it. Comedians are lazy and we don't want to do everything. <laughs> <Yeah. right. laughs> yep. We like, don't want to, but I don't want to. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I do. But like I said, it's, you know, like I'll use this in ex- as an example too. Like, you know, I just shot this special and I didn't even really shop it around because I just wanted to put it out for free. And if you like it, tell a friend and I think you'll love it and then come see me on the road or you just, you know, say hi or, you know, follow me on Twitter, do whatever. But I 10 years ago might not have have been able to just do that, like put it out on you. Like there was a gatekeeper at one point, like I could have self-produced this, which I didn't shot it myself and done all that. And then that might have been where it ended. Nobody might have ever seen it. Now, at least I'll get some eyeballs on this thing. And that's a very so it's a cool, super cool DIY time we're living in, you know. Yeah. And that's music's always been like that, though. I feel like, you know, ever since, you know, making your own demo tape, making a seven inch or something, you know, that's always been the cool thing about music. Like you can start a band and eventually get something down. And, you know, that always seemed like that was the dream of get our demo tape heard or. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of the punk rock dudes almost yeah. started that do it yourself thing yeah. because nobody else would make records. So they're just like, fuck it, we're gonna go make our own records. And now it's got totally. even easier because hell you don't even have to make CDs if you don't want to anymore. You don't have to make product. You can just get it up somewhere else and it's you know Absolutely. it's just way cheaper. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so before I let you go, what is the first time you remember hearing about my grandpa Willie Nelson? Um Wow, first time I heard about Willie. That's a good question um because i thought your grandpa was ricky nelson <laughs> <laughs> I, the nelson twins that's yeah. Willie, yeah. that's it yeah. right nelson <laughs> gunner yeah. and uh, the other guy's name i believe it was yeah. i so i'm a huge grateful dead fan and uh i believe it was through the dead i used to you know be in that era in of that what's that <laughs> <laughs> no, I know he, he wasn't in the Grateful Dead. I'm sorry. Um, I am pretty sure they've, but they must have toured at some point, or I've heard of them talking or yes, shows yes. together um, where he was on my radar. Because I'll be honest, country and that kind of wasn't, you know, really a big part of my musical appreciation until probably a few years ago. I think Willie so, and, and Jerry Garcia had a tour at Love Affair for like six months, somewhere in the 60s. <laughs> I don't know if they ever played music together. A tour bus Love Affair? Possibly. Torrid. Oh. <laughs> um, but I, I, Willie is so, he is just such a part of American culture. I don't remember him ever not being at least somebody I knew of. Yeah. Because you know? he's so identifiable. I don't want to get it wrong and be like, um, Half baked, yeah. But, probably. Hey, we've Maybe. heard Dukes of Hazard on here too. So Dukes of Hazard, the yeah. I was, the even the Simpsons, you know. For <laughs> Ray Lynn, never met him till Dukes of Hazard. I think on the set. <laughs> <laughs> that's her first memory. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have a definitive one. I'm sorry, that's a. I kind of okay. bailed on the answer, but I don't have like a definitive moment. Um, I mean, I'm at my mom's house. Her landline is ringing. Sorry. <laughs> it's a sound you don't hear very often yeah yeah exactly uh she's moving and i'm trying to help her pack so uh oh, good son i think man, let's go with half-baked he was so great in half-baked what a funny funny cameo yeah, yeah. and perfect too perfect <laughs> it's hilarious. Boy, comedy chops man he really he has the comedy chops he could have crossed over yeah, he's always been an, a funny guy. You all know? those old Love country jokes. dudes, all those old country stars are hilarious. All of them. Always yeah. had the mindset of seeing the funny in things, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Jerry Reed. Like how funny Jerry Reed is, and like, you know, oh man, he was Amanda hysterical. Stuff. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, dude, thanks for doing this with us. I appreciate you coming on. And, yeah, man, this was great. And okay, your special is Check Right, and it's coming out October sixth, and um, on your YouTube. Yep. Yeah, just type in Andy Fiore, andyfiore.com. It has all my links to my tour dates and my tickets and all that stuff and all the socials. Uh, I'm trying to get better on all that stuff. But yeah, thank you guys for having me. I, I felt like I rambled the whole time, but this is oh, such a thrill. Great. I literally, I, I love the cross, the music and comedy crossover is, is my favorite things to talk about, you know? Yeah, me too. I feel like we could have gone so much deeper and so much more music stuff, but 
We could have been. But we always, it's funny when we talk, we're like, well, we want to hear about comedy. You guys talk about (laughs) music, music. What about the comedy? All right. You guys have, well, you guys come on the Raw Report on my Sirius XM show and then we'll do it vice versa. Absolutely. And Raylan will be in in touch about her job at Sirius within the next two or three days. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. I mean, no, I go use an intern. (laughs) Can I give you college credit, Raylan? Yes. And I think, (laughs) I think music is funny would be great on Sirius XM. I'm trying to figure out. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We'll find you a home. Thank you. Thank man. you guys so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Bye. Andy Fiore is my favorite comedian. Yeah, man. I like that dude a lot. It was fun. I think we're friends. Yeah, maybe we'll hang out. Yeah. Anyway, enjoy your groceries. Don't be an asshole. I know your mama's name. Did we cheers yet? Enjoy your cigarette.